Good morning, everybody. Bill Pitkin. Um, <laughs> I'm not from Arkansas. I'm from Iowa, originally. So, you know, that general area of the country. Uh, pleasure to be with you, um, and congrats to the Economic Roundtable 25 years. I've got a great panel here. Um, we've just heard from the supervisor about um, what a lot of people call this crisis of homelessness and affordable housing and poverty. You could go on and on. Um, and when we hear the word crisis, we often think about this is a very recent new phenomenon. Of course, this isn't. Um, I was thinking about 25 years ago, 1991, uh, which is actually the year I came to Los Angeles. And uh, thinking about that time, uh, and of course, a lot of the issues that we're talking about today, have, even before that time, there are roots to the, to the issues that we're, we're facing. But uh, you know, the 1980s, a time of big population growth, uh, economic construction, some of the issues that the Economic Roundtable was covering in its early uh, reports in the 90s. Uh, in 1987, uh, the LA Times uh, did a, a uh, kind of came up with an estimate on the issue of gar garage conversions, people living in the garages, an estimated there are 200,000 people living in garages in LA County. Uh, we had, there was also a period where a lot of new housing development uh, organizations, nonprofits, um, we were first started in the late 1980s. Uh, we also, uh, it was really, it was a time when affordable housing came to the crisis. Mayor Bradley appointed Blue Urban Commission on affordable housing, which led to the establishment of the LA Housing Department, now the uh, HCID. Uh, so there was really a housing crisis in the 80s. Um, so right around the time um, of, of the early 90s was really when this was coming to a head. And then of course we had civil unrest in 1992. Uh, and the earthquake in 1994 that created new challenges. So during that, just going back that time when I first came, the Economic Roundtable was starting. Uh, it was a time when a lot of the, the issues that we're seeing today uh, were really coming to a head. Um, but it was also a time when there was a lot of infrastructure and research and policy and advocacy work that was starting. And I think we're seeing the, the fruits of that uh, today to some extent. And we've got four leaders here to to help uh, bring us up to today and what's happening, what we know. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, the issue, the challenges in housing, homelessness, health, and big data, um, and what it can help us uh, do and learn. And we also want to talk about solutions, of course. So uh, I will introduce very briefly our, our panelists. You have their full, fuller bios in, in the materials. Um, we're first going to have Joan Ling. Uh, speak, and, and she has been very active in the affordable housing community development for, for, for several decades, and is now at the UCLA at Toronto River Planning. How many UCLA River Planning folks do we have here? Okay. Wow. All right. They're, they're everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Next, Chris Coe, uh, who's with United Way, Greater LA, leads the Home for Good collaboration. Uh, how many people have donated United Way or been on Homewalk? Anybody been to Homewalk? So, all right. Good. Uh, next, we have Gail Holland, uh, columnist with the LA Times. Does a lot of reporting on homelessness and is going to share some of her perspective. How many people read the LA Times? <laughs> <laughs> All right. And last but not least, um, Dan Flaming. You've heard from already. Um, the Economic Roundtable. I hope this is unanimous. How many people have read something through the Economic Roundtable? <laughs> All right. Good. All right. Let's get started, and we're going to start with Joe uh, to talk about uh, affordable housing. Uh, and extent of the housing crisis here in the LA region. Okay. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to um, put some numbers to our housing crisis in Los Angeles County, uh, talk about how we got here, and uh, what we can do about it all in five minutes. So I'll talk really quick. Um, just in terms of magnitude, let me just frame the LA County for just a sec. Um, LA County, 10 million people, about three and a half million households. And among the population and the households, over a million renter households are considered housing burdened, housing cost burdened. And over half a million owners are also housing cost burdened. Since the government defines housing burden as, the, as paying 30% or more of your gross income before taxes, um, for housing cost each month. So it's a really, uh, it's hard to get your arms around such numbers. I'm just going to focus for, you know, on renter households. 
for a minute. Um, for renters, if you make less than $35,000 a year in your household, it could be a household of one or it could be a household of five, um, all grouped together. Over 90% of us making less than $35,000 a year are rent burdened. If you make between thirty-five dollars to $50,000 a year, over 70% rent burdened. If you make fifty to $75,000 a year, 40%. If you make over $75,000, um, 10% of us are rent burdened. So, so essentially, if you're looking at the first group, 90%, over 90% rent burden for people making, households making $35,000 or less, you're really talking about households that are one or two paychecks away from being homeless. So you know, after framing the housing crisis, um, my colleagues will be talking about the homeless issues um, in LA County. So that's a little bit about the magnitude of our challenge. So how did we get here? Um, over the last 10 years, there's been a divergence of income and rent trends in LA County. From 2005 to 2015, income went up by about 22%. Rent, however, went up by 39%. So the rent increase rate is almost double our income increase rate. And that's why, um, as Bill mentioned, you know, we already had somewhat of a crisis in the 80s and 90s, and it's just been more and more exaggerated. Um, so that's one major uh, challenge to our housing crisis. The second one is NIMBY and down zoning. Um, a UCLA PhD student in urban planning <coughs> three years ago did his dissertation on LA City, LA City's uh, zoning capacity. In 1960, the zoning capacity for LA City is 10 million people. It was zoned to accommodate 10 million people. And at that time, there were only 2 million residents in LA City. Today, the zoning capacity, we have about 4 million people living in the city of LA. The zoning capacity is about 200,000 people over that 4 million existing residents. What it means is that over the last four decades or so, there's been repeated down zoning in response to people who are tired of development, tired of park, tired of traffic, tired of problem finding parking, and as a result, <coughs> you know, we have very little um, production going on. Give you another example. In the 1950s, we were building in LA County as a whole. We were building in LA County 72,000 units per year. Since 2010, we're building less than 8,000 units. <coughs> have to kind of do the math to see, you know, population growing, households growing, and housing production not growing. Part of the challenge of addressing the affordability crisis is that we're losing federal money, we're losing state money, and we're losing local money. Federal money, um, there are two significant sources of home and CDBG community block Community development block grant um, money, um, and they have basically been eviscerated. Uh, for example, the city of LA used to get, I think, about 50 to 60 million dollars of home money. It's now getting a little over 20 million dollars. And um, on the state level, the state has this bad habit of not uh, passing a uh, housing trust fund with a permanent source, and instead, every few years, they go out to the voters to raise general fund revenues, uh, bond revenues for housing. Well, it's not happening in the last uh, number of years, so the state has essentially running out of general housing uh, capital funds. On a local level, because of the discontinuation of redevelopment, LA City itself 
lost about half a billion dollars of redevelopment funds every year, of which 25%, um, 20, 25% used to go to affordable housing. In addition to loss of money and uh, lack of production, what we do have in terms of market rate production is just not meeting the people who live here. As, you, as, as I've mentioned, there's been a divergence of rents and income. And the new units that I've built, you know, the 8,000 units that are being built in the county, um, they're mostly targeted to high-end market rate projects because that's what it takes to pencil out development. So you're talking about rents, starting rents of $2,500, $3,000 a month. <laughs> so that's how we got where we are. What, uh, let's just very quickly look at, um, look at what it costs to solve the affordability crisis. So I did a little bit of quick math calculation and only targeted to renters, households, households making less than $50,000 a year. It turns out that we need about $5 billion a year to support, make, to il eliminate the rent burden um, situation in LA County. And if you say, well, you know, let's not do it every year, you know, let's not put in money every year, let's uh, just fix it one time. Um, that would cost us about 10, 100, billion dollars if you just look at using money to solve the problem. But that's not going to be the case. There are really two ways, two categories of solutions. One is money. The other one is land use, power, uh, police power of the cities and the counties. Um, so I borrowed this chart from Karen Chapel from UC Berkeley. And she aptly summarized all the solutions that we've been talking about for the last decade about how to address the housing crisis. And it's too small, I don't mean to pre present it to you as a way of um, you know, studying it, but if you're interested in this chart, uh, talk to Dan or we'll be posting it online um, so you can look at it in detail. But I have a short to-do list in LA County First, support uh, Supervisor Ridley Thomas's proposal to increase uh, the sales tax by a quarter percent. Second, the city is, um, the city of Los Angeles is proposing a linkage fee ordinance that is going to head into um, committee pretty soon. Support that. That would raise money uh, for affordable housing. Generally, support more money for affordable housing. Uh, on the state level and on the uh, local level. I don't have a lot of hope for federal level, so I don't even, I'm not gonna even talk about that. And we must, we must, we must upzone our, our cities in order to create more capacity for new construction. But that upzoning must be coupled with requiring affordable housing to be set aside or else it would be pretty meaningless. We'd be building for the top 10% and not uh, the rest. Um, the last thing I want to uh, ask you to, uh, to do is to encourage that we fund and enforce existing laws. The fact is that there is rent control, there is tenant production, um, a lot of good ordinances and laws and regulations in place but we need to enforce them, or else they're just sitting in, in, in the books and, you know, uh, without doing anything. So again, money and land use policies. Um, well, this seems kind of daunting, so uh, I'm going to quickly talk about the wins that we've had just in the last election, because it en encourages us and it informs us that it can be done if there is will. So on the money side, look at Al Alameda County, 50, $580 million for affordable housing, Santa Clara County, $950 million, propositions J and K in San Francisco, um, increasing sales tax by three quarters, of, three quarters of a percent. We're only asking for a quarter percent in March. 
uh, measures K, San Francisco, extends um, sales tax for homeless services, um, proposition HHH, yay. Um, and I'm going to move on to more wins. Land use, and I'll be done in 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> land use, yay, measure JJJ, uh, passed. Santa Monica defeated a measure that would have significantly impeded um, development. Proposition U in San Francisco um, also defeated um, because there was an attempt to increase the, um, afford the income affordability for people who would be helped. Last topic, um, more wins, and that's related to tenant protection. Richmond, limit rent increase um, to CPI. Uh, Mountain View, limit rent increase. Measure JJ in Oakland, strengthening existing um, just cause and rent stabilization ordinances. So you, these are the wins that we had in November 2016. And looking forward, I think that on the state and local level, um, let's get to work we're hopeful and um, we will lick this problem one way or the other. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. Um, you know it's good when all of the other panelists are studying the, the other presenters and taking notes. So appreciate that. Uh, I also really appreciate Dan and the Economic Roundtable. I think it's fitting for us to be here. Um, at the 25 year mark because even for us at Home for Good, one of your studies, as you know, uh, the Where Early Sleep study was a big part of how we launched. So the stuff matters, the work of um, Dan and his team really do matter and make a big difference. So I begin, yeah, the presentation. it's just on the desktop. So I'll, um, I will actually end where Joan started and, and tie a little bit back to the affordable housing crisis. Um, but when I begin very serious presentations, um, I start very serious presentations by noting that my parents did not intend to name me after a cooking oil, but it's <laughs> 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 Um, but on a much more serious note, the supervisor teed this up to really show the scope of our crisis. But you know, last night and on any given night this um, this year, this is what we are estimating in terms of people sleeping on streets, shelters, and in their vehicles. And this is a number we talk about very often. I want to break it down into a couple sub numbers um, that we don't talk about as often, but that you may also know. One is that Skid Row, though it really captures the attention generally of the public, is actually a fraction of that stat before. So less than 10% of our homeless neighbors actually live on Skid Row. So said the other way, over 90% of our homeless uh, experiences exist in our communities all across the county. So this is really and truly a county-wide phenomenon that is not limited at this point to any part of our county. And you've probably seen it, you've probably seen it. I think something about the homeless count, under the number, something that's occurred is the unsheltered, the visible part of homelessness has increased dramatically, right? So that percentage, underneath the overall percentage, the visible homelessness has gone up much more significantly than the rate we see. The other part in the number that I really want you to uh, step away from and understand the homeless count, so those are the numbers there, but underneath of that, there's a couple major asterisks. One, which is that the youth count, this is a very good thing. Um, as a county and the local continuum of care uh, for the housing of the Homeless Services Authority, they conducted a comprehensive youth count for the first time that they included at this scale for the first time. That is part of the number that wasn't part before. So if you see the youth number, it's not that it dramatically increased by that much, although youth generally it is increasing. Um, it's, it's an improvement in methodology. So if you look at that number from one to the other, a large chunk of that increase is the inclusion of this uh, youth count. 
What is also not normally shown in this number are three significant decreases in the number, or notable decreases, I should say. So you see the veteran number within that overall increase went down, the family number went down, and even chronic homelessness actually went down. And I point that out because within the vast crisis of homelessness, I think it's important for us to hold on to the fact that there are actual solutions that have been proven <coughs> to the situation. I think some of you have been in other cities across uh, the world, or even in America at a point where it never, it didn't look like this. So there are very real solutions. This is a, a dramatic representation of one solution, uh, part of the Project 50 pilot that the county, um, that the county experimented with, and this wonderful man at Givens is a very real story, where after spending decades on the street, uh, struggling with serious health challenges, after finding street outreach and permits for housing, that is a representation for Ed, but also for the hundreds of other numbers that you saw on the chart before, that there are solutions to this crisis in ways that we can actually uh, make a dent serious ways. So talking about that, and at scale, this is a chart of veteran homelessness. So part of the reason that Home for Good is an initiative of the United Way and the Chamber of Commerce, now fueled by the uh, collective efforts of 200 plus community organizations. But that has resulted in intentional investments in veteran homelessness you see there. You see a drop. The whole idea of if you build it or if you resource, they will come is not true. I mean, you can see that here. Resourced at a level that we never did before. And you see the 60% uh, drop over the five years. So how do we do that? What does that translate to? And what are we looking at? I thought this was really interesting in Joan's point, too, because this is actually fits very neatly with how we break down our work at Home for Good, and I think in, in the sector in terms of systems work. So how do we get that to go down? I think we focus on improving policy and performance, expanding resources and capacity, and really building the public and political will to really act on one and two. So in terms of expanding resources, it's, it's having more resources, but also making sure it works in smarter ways. So you know, if, if you're a funder in this room, that how we fund as funders and how we fund together as funders is critically important. So something that we did is create a, the Funders Collaborative with seed capital from the Conrad and Hilton Foundation and really talk about how can we fund in ways that actually don't create redundancy and go uh, to further impact. And that's meant working with our public funders and our private funders and growing that year over year over time. In terms of improving policy and performance, it's looked like how do we create systems? So in LA, we have had whether you, you realize it or not, we've had nationally leading programs in homelessness. The problem has not been that we need better programs, although we can all improve. We have really top class programs. So if you think about your phone, if you look at your phone, it's kind of like the apps versus the operating system. It's what happened to Microsoft 20 years ago, right? So uh, you, you are thinking about switching to Apple, but you can't let go of the word perfect. Word, right? So um, that system versus program performance, when we talk about improving systems and performance, we're talking about bringing the system up to scale. So this is a uh, kind of a system of what we call match.com for housing um, to improve the performance. And this is on a chart how those two things come together. So this is a graphical illustration, it's representative, uh, not exact, but where you see that light blue line is where chronic homelessness generally was trending. So here's a big note. That flat, slightly decreasing line is a huge win. So the county, this represents the county of Los Angeles really doubling down on its health resources, its probation resources, going uh, historically doing that at 2,000 units a year, doubling that now to 4,000 or 2,000 units over a few years, 4,000 units now. Triple H. You see, with those 10,000 units, you see that dip. But where you see, what you will notice is that that alone does not end the job either. We need a 15% decrease in inflow or a relative increase in housing placements to actually end the job. So those things together uh, make a difference. And that inflow especially is why this increased money around uh, improving the prison reentry, uh, the hospital system, the foster care system, where a lot of this money from the sales tax would help 
is so important. Uh, one chart, that 10,000 units, again, not a drop in the bucket. This is the permanent support of housing inventory for adults for countywide between 2010 and 2016. You will see that it went up by about 1,675 units. So 10,000 units truly is a pretty historic jump in our count. Um, because what we've built in the meantime, this is more of reality what it is, is that the other side had a few units and the inflow has been increasing. And the reason why the inflow has been increasing, to tie back to Joan's point, if there's any singular metric that you can point to as tying homelessness, it's affordability in housing, right? So what you'll see on this map, this is a national map showing overall trends in homelessness nationwide. And what you will note, the gray states are the, the numbers where homelessness has increased. The blue ones are where it went down. These are not just the states where it's warmer. So the general idea of people go where it's warm. Um, New York is not that warm. Maine is not that Maine is not that warm. Even Seattle. So what you'll notice, what these states actually carry in commonality is the lack, the decrease and diminishing affordability. So as we've had a homelessness crisis that we've responded to with real solutions, we've had a very serious housing crisis. Uh, bloom at the same time, and those two have an intimate relation. For every $100 in average rent that goes up, you can almost chart it to be about a 10% increase in homelessness. So our, this is a very serious situation on both fronts, and one uh, that I'm happy that as a county in this city, I think we're starting to tackle in real form. So thank you. housing, affordability, and homelessness, and Gail's going to go next and uh, kind of share from her reporting on the streets on, on these issues, um, you know, what, what she's seeing out there. Yeah, no, I'm going to give you a small few um, of the people that I've met and the questions they've raised in my mind. Is my mic <laughs> Okay. Now? Yes. Ready? Yeah. Okay, Joe Waddell Jr., 59, lives under the Harbor Freeway at 39th Street. Um, he's the seventh of eight children in Memphis, Tennessee. He left his home at age 14. He told me his mother was alcoholic and his sisters used to beat him to try to get him to do the housework. Um, he came to Los Angeles in the 1980s and he's basically um, survived with what he describes as hustles. Um, some are legal, like recycling, and he sells stuff. You know, if you see people who put the blanket out, and another form of recycling, but one that has money involved, and drug sales and other things. Waddell recently left Skid Row. He built a very elaborate camp under the freeway with, he has a guest room, a jacuzzi, a living room set, and a tent that he rents out to another homeless man. And it, he has everything covered with zebra print covers that, since people have asked me, it's quite sure where did he get them? In the fabric district, <laughs> where you can get anything for a dollar a yard. Um, a lot of the people in the neighborhood really like him. They come, I spent a couple days at his camp for hours of the day and came by and had cigarettes. One guy brought his meat over so they could barbecue together. He has three barbecues. The city took his camp down twice. And the second time, within one day, he recreated the entire thing from cast offs in the neighborhood. And that's not a rich neighborhood. I was pretty amazed. Um, a video, somebody put a video up. It was viewed by 1.4 million people. And I learned this morning, looking online, that this story was picked up literally all over the world, like in the Netherlands and Germany. And for some reason, they love these stories. Um, because it makes us look bad. Um, and because of his internet celebrity, which he loves, I might add, a lot of people drive by and want to take selfies with him or they see him as a celebrity. Okay, his story raises many issues beyond the, what to me is the most important, the resiliency of the human spirit to create something, you know, that makes him feel comfortable and that he likes. Um, the first is that he came from Skid Row. Um, as we all know, people from Skid Row have spread all over. Um, 
Waddell told me that he used to go back and forth between the streets and staying in hotels, some of which are now permanent supportive housing, and many of which are gone. There's a lot of places in my reporting in downtown that I've learned that people used to stay. For example, there's a parking lot across from the Times that's under the city land that's going to be a park next to Grand Park. There was apparently hundreds of people living in that parking lot for years. And they're still out there because I've met them. And they've described this to me. There was a lot of squats. And I wondered, is anybody tracking, not necessarily the parking lot, of course, but the loss of these hotels or these places the people used to go to? And I also met some people who told me something I thought was interesting, which is that like their dads used to get uh, check into these kind of downtown hotels to kind of cool off when the family scene got too intense. Uh, in you know poorer families, and that's gone because those hotels really aren't there anymore. And I wonder, is anybody tracking that? Um, okay, Waddell at least at one time had Section 8 housing. He had a partner. He lived. He told me he lived for 10 years in kind of the Gardena area. When his partner died, he lost his housing, and that's a super super common story that I'm sure many people have heard where the two people are able to create the income or get the benefits or whatever it is. Um, and I also wondered in that regard, he told me that they were getting, and again, I didn't really check this out, but his story stands for many other people's story. They were getting case management and medical care. They have, you know, both have problems. Um, my understanding is that a lot of the housing programs track retention for a year. And I know Molly Lowry, who many of you know, told me that she thinks three years is a crisis point. So I wonder, should we change that? Should we be tracking retention longer? Because I very rarely meet anybody on the street who hasn't been there on and off for years. OK. Um, now, Waddell set up as part of a whole bunch of camps that maybe many anybody's seen. You can see them from the uh, 110 Harbor Freeway going north and south. At one point, a man named Elvis Summers uh, built these tiny houses for those people. Um, the number one thing that the people in the tiny houses told me that they liked about their tiny houses is that they had doors with locks and keys. And um, I know the city has been very concerned about these encampments and people's belongings everywhere. Well, the belongings were in the houses. It's perhaps not a solution, but maybe it's a solution to that. Um, in addition, um, especially some of the people I talked to were really concerned about that were the many women. I think most of you know that the number of women who are homeless is such a dramatic increase. It's one in three now. And they face unbelievable levels of violence in the street and in shelters, they say. But the city hauled these houses away, and now they're back in tents or worse. And the city has said that they're concentrating on providing permanent housing. And I know that that's what people um, feel is, a, you know, the final solution. But Waddell says he's been waiting for months for a voucher. And as you probably know, there are scores of people out there with vouchers who can't find a place. Um, the city seems to vacillate us, all of us, between vilifying homeless people and fetishizing them. Um, in addition to the tiny houses, which was another huge internet sensation, um, there's a man named Birdman who was living under a freeway in uh, the, the uh, border of Echo Park in historic Filipino town. He trained the pigeons to perform for the people getting off the freeway, and that's how he got his spare change. So an artist who's actually gone all over the city named Skid Robot painted like kind of a living room scene behind his house um, and again, you know, a lot of people like that on the internet and everything. But I met another man who lived next to Birdman named Charles Leonard Smith, who had subsidized housing in Baldwin Park, uh, I'm sorry, Baldwin Hills. He was a veteran. He had a very committed case manager who I met, or social worker. Um, she tried really hard to help him. He was very impressed by his work. Um, he said he had no friends or no TV at his new home. And he said he came back to visit. I don't know if he was living there. He was stabbed to death in his tent earlier this year. And it hasn't been solved. So 
I think, you know, while admiring people's ingenuity and coming up with a way to survive on the street, it's a very dangerous place. Um, one other thing that, okay, I have too much here. <laughs> Let me skip to the end. Um, some of the smartest people I know in homelessness have posed to me this question, do we try, do the solutions we provide for homelessness adhere too much to middle class values? And um, do we need to look beyond that to what people really need and want? And in that regard, it seems like homelessness is, the more that I've been talking to homeless people, it's such a profound experience. It um, just strikes at your whole sense of self and identity. And I wonder if our solutions are helping people find a meaning in life and you know, a purpose for their life and being reintegrated into society and not simply a place to live. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gail, for putting names and faces on all the numbers we've been talking about. Also, for the shout out to the caseworkers who, in my experience, do amazing work. So, thank you. Thank you, Gail. I want to pick up on your idea of solutions. Thank you very much. So, I'm going to go through five slides that draw on uh, work of the roundtable, moving quickly through affordable housing, homelessness, and big data. So the big picture is we have um, a demand for affordable housing that vastly overwhelms the supply. This graphic on the right um, shows that for every affordable housing unit, we have four households that are uh, eligible for affordable housing. A subset of people uh, who need affordable housing is people who are homeless. And for every person who meets HUD's definition of homelessness, this does not include people couch surfing. This is people who are out of housing. We have three individuals for every bed or unit that's available. So if we don't add to it, the existing supply shrinks. So new investment is critical, but we really can't build our way out of homelessness unless we reduce the number flowing into homelessness, except on your point, Chris. We have to reduce the flow of people into homelessness, and we have to accelerate early exits from homelessness. When we see the same person on the sidewalk day after day, it's easy to forget that most folks have comparatively short stints of homelessness. This graphic on the right looks at um, People who, the entire population that experienced homelessness over a six year period, half of folks only had five months or less of, of, of being homeless within five years. Another 20% were uh, six to 15 months of homelessness. And then three smaller groups with longer and longer increments, extending up to six years of continuous homelessness. The longer people are homeless, the more personal, medical, and legal wreckage accumulates in their life, and the harder it is to make an exit from homelessness. It is critically important that we increase the rate of early exits from homelessness and reduce chronic homelessness. There is a solution for every person's problems, but there are no mass solutions. And one of the things I think we need to do better is matching the right solution with the right person. Our take on it from data we work with is shown in this graphic on the right. Each figure represents 10% of the homeless population. Our take on it is that employment is a critical solution for 70% of folks who experience homelessness. This includes many people with shorter stints. For half of folks, basic affordable housing uh, is, is an important solution. For 40% of people, there are significant medical health care and behavioral health issues that need to be addressed. And then we estimate that 10% of people who experience homelessness um, are eligible for SSI and not getting it. 
and with SSI benefits could access affordable housing and be stably housed. And finally, we think that 10% of people who experience homelessness, the only solution is permanent uh, supportive housing. <clears throat> so one of the graphics we've done that's gotten a lot of exposure is this, these graphics that look at the 10% of people who have the highest public cost, the 10th decile of people experiencing homelessness. And these, these graphs are for actual people uh, in Los Angeles County before they were housed and after they were housed. So before they were housed, costs were about 67,000 a year. After they were housed, about 19,000 a year. This is a solution that is much cheaper than the problem. And often, good solutions are cheaper than problems. We, um, the data that we use to develop this, uh, this cost profile, we also have used to develop predictive analytic models, or what we call triage tools, for both uh, Los Angeles and Santa Clara counties for identifying these individuals with very, very high public costs. We believe more tools are needed to target interventions for uh, unemployed but employable adults. That's a critical group justice-involved individuals, kids who've experienced trauma, children with mental illness, transition-age foster and probation youth, adolescents with high-risk behaviors, and displaced households. The tools for doing this uh, are big data. The uh, cost data that we just showed came from linked public records of individuals who have contact with public agencies and were homelessness. And if you take these contacts one at a time, we only see fragments of a person. But when we link this data, it's like seeing, um, it's like seeing a hidden iceberg in its entirety. We're able to see a complete person. We're able to see how that person changes over time. We can see who becomes homeless. We can see their families. We can see their health and justice system involvement. We can see their employment outcomes, and we can build tools for matching the right intervention to the right person. So from our perspective, this is an important next step to um, build these tools to target many more interventions for many more targeted subgroups and to see where system change is needed. We're going to have uh, some mics pretty soon, but I'll, I'll start off with some, maybe a, a couple questions for the, for the panelists, but I'd love to have all of you ask questions. I know a lot of people have a lot of experience here. Um, you know, one of the, my early teachers on, uh, on a homelessness or housing crisis, um, actually uh, Tori Osborne here in the front row, uh, back from her experience at the mayor's office and Project 50 and all that work, I remember talking about, you know, uh, the mix of people dealing with personal vulnerabilities and then systems challenges, right? Um, so thanks, this is complex, right? Because they're often very personal issues and Gail shared some of those. We've, we've heard of some of those things um, from some of the panelists. Uh, and then there are real systems barriers, be they jail, access to health care, mental health, uh, education system, the foster care, youth system, child welfare, et cetera. Um, and so it can seem overwhelming. Right, and there's the then there's the time horizon challenge. Right, there's the immediate need. Right, the numbers that we have, the people who are living on the streets, um, and there are immediate uh, solutions and long term. I mean, the, the affordable housing needs um, that are you know hopefully happening soon, but also long term. So, uh, I guess my question uh, for all of you is, um, from where you sit, you know, we have to kind of think long term, short term, long term, uh, targeted to personal issues, but also there are systems level challenges. You know, with limited time and resources that we each have, where do you, where do you see yourself focusing? What would be a recommendation for people on an area that they should be focusing on over the next year? What are, what are key things that you think? John, you want to start off? 
Yeah, sure. Um, I think that in the next year, short term, that uh, there are a lot of opportunities to um, build on <coughs> measure um, HHH. HHH, thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, to raise money for affordable housing and homeless uh, 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 permanent supportive housing and, uh, and homeless services. I think in the long term, at, at a more fundamental level, we must reform our land use system. Because if we don't let housing get built, and we don't link affordable housing to the new units that are getting built, um, we are going to keep creating and recreating the same crisis that we face today. I would, I would say that something that threads on the short and long term opportunities of the next year is really your neighbor's understanding of homelessness and our public understanding of it. Uh, I think that impacts both, because we finally have some of the short term investments at a city level and the county's team and big one up at the countywide level that we've never had before. And already in trying to use them, now we're hitting resistance and people actually believe in these issues. So both in terms of trying to win a county ballot, but in terms of citing some of the investments that have been made in short term solutions, even like shelter storage. Uh, that relies a lot on what your neighbor feels and thinks about our homeless neighbors. And if they truly believe that they have the dignity and equal standing that Gail talked about. So I think something that we can all do a lot of work on is that. And it also plays out in the vouchers Gail talked about. When people are walking around with vouchers, when the landlord sees them as a lost cause or a really risky case, it means they're not, they are putting them on a different mental as a result, we're having to build dedicated units instead. So I think that mental recognition, I think, is uh, a huge short-term barrier that unlocks a lot of long-term investment. My take on it is that um, there are systems in regular contact with most of the folks who experience homelessness. So they may well be in contact with the public social services, the healthcare system, the justice system, to name a few, and that out of um, a relatively brief encounter with a homeless person, it's hard to figure out just who they are and what they need. That none of us expose all of ourselves instantly when we meet anyone. And if we have conditions that are stigmatizing, you know, we don't, we don't reveal it all, and we need to get better at using the tools we have <coughs> to understand people and to target the right help for the right person. Information about most of the people who experience homelessness is available in public systems. It is possible to use that data to identify opportunities for, for people, the opportunities that match their needs, not to take things away from them, but the next time they're meant to say, you know, we, we, we have a program that could offer a job for you, or we, uh, we can help you with that substance abuse problem if you want to be. And to be able to be better at managing those responses to the individuals as we need. Well, as a journalist, I don't really propose solutions, but I have some <laughs> questions. Um, I wonder about the immediate needs of people in the street as far as especially bathrooms and showers and I wonder why these things I've been doing this three years and the same things I mean the housing will not be there in the next year is my understanding and I don't really see what the short-term plan is and it seems like that could be a baseline thing to address uh, is some kind of bathroom and shower facilities so people go for a job if they have an opportunity. Because there are a lot of people out there that <laughs> seem, for all, you know, it seems that most people focus on the obviously disabled or mentally ill people, but there's a lot of people out there that are much more able-bodied than I think a casual look would, would give and who say they want to work and who do work. They recycle or they sell stuff or they do things. 